Jesus appears to the disciples. Then the two from Emmaus told their story how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road, and how they recognised him as he was breaking the bread. And just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them. Peace be with you. Shalom. I said. But the whole group was st startled and frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. Why are you frightened, he asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me and make sure that I'm not a ghost, because ghosts don't have bodies, as you see that I do. And he spoke and showed them his hands and his feet. Still they stood there in disbelief, filled with joy and wonder. Then he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he ate it as they watched. Then he said, When I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said, Yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. And it was also written that this message would be, would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses to all these things. And now I will send the Holy Spirit, just as my Father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. May the Lord bless his word and may he open our minds to understand the scriptures as Jesus uh, did with the disciples. Now, I want to start with a question. Uh, I've used this before, but it's been for some years. As Christian believers, should we be pessimistic or optimistic. <coughs> Think about that. Where are you at the moment? I'm leaning towards the, the pessimistic at the moment. I'm not about to have you in the Leaders should have left me on a spiritual high, but I felt really down or something. <laughs> I think it's spiritual depression. Yeah. Anyway, there's a lot of uh, doom and gloom around in the news and media at the moment. If you bother to watch the news, that is. Energy prices, soaring, cost of living, inflation, the, the threat of more taxes, war in Ukraine, and if you've uh, watched the news as well, a serious famine in North Africa. Much to cause us worry, concern, fear, and anxiety, especially when they talk, start talking about nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. um, as Christian believers, we have to face the present day realities. So, whether you think you should be optimistic or pessimistic, actually, we should be realistic. Mm -hmm. Realistic. And we have to act and respond to the challenges we face. As we give, give of our money and our time and energy, as we support and act and pray. But our outlook and overview must always be on the optimistic side, filled with hopefulness and faith, and a confidence that God and good will ultimately prevail. A confidence that God will triumph over evil, death, sin, and Satan. If you've read, read Revelation, that's what it tells us. But we, in the meantime, we, we must not retreat from the, rea the realities of life and this world. 
Jesus does not call us to withdraw or to bury our heads in the sand. We may not know what the future holds for us, personally, individually, or even as a church, but we trust the one who holds the future and who promises never to leave us nor forsake us, and who also promises to always be with us. Now, do you remember that Beck Midler and also Chris Fritchin had a hit song which was called from a distance, God is watching us. That one? That one? Okay. Yeah, nice tune. Interesting verse that they sung about the God. But it's not what the scriptures tell us. It's, it's the wrong idea of God. God isn't distant. Way up there in the heavens looking down on us. God is not distant from us. He's not looking on us with sympathy. We don't want sympathy. <laughs> People don't like sympathy, do they? When it's, you know, well, you, you don't really know what it's like. And God in Jesus Christ shares our humanity. Jesus is able, this is the word we want, empathise. You know the difference between sympathy, sympathy is from a difference, oh bless you, I hope you soon get well. Empathy is when you're actually with the person, perhaps even going through <coughs> the problems and difficulties um, they're, they're experiencing. Jesus has walked, the, the Indians talked about you being a, an empathetic, he's walking in their moccasins. Yeah? Walking in their shoes. Jesus has done that. He's borne our skin. He knows our humanity. He felt, he's felt our pain, experienced our sadness and loss. He wept at his friend's tomb, Lazarus. He wept over Jerusalem, knowing what was going to become of them. Jesus knew deep sorrow. He knew betrayal, his friends deserting him. He knew abandonment that we probably won't ever experience in our life. He knew about mental, physical, even spiritual agony. The writer of the Hebrews reminds us in Hebrews 4.15 that the High Priest, Jesus is now our High Priest in the Holy of Holies, who has entered the holy place, the very presence of God, understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testing we do, yet he did not sin. So he knows how to overcome. Later in the same letter, the, uh, 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 Hebrews, he writes, Jesus, Jesus Christ ever lives to make intercession for us. So he not only knows about it, he's praying for us there in heaven, interceding for us before the Father. Lord, help them, give them strength, whatever the need is. Not only he prays for us, but he sent his presence to be with us through the person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, Jesus is with us through the Holy Spirit, it's his Spirit. Holy Spirit. <clears throat> we cannot fully enter into or comprehend all that Jesus Christ went through and experienced for us that caused him to cry out on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Can't begin to imagine what it meant for the Son of God to be separated from his Father. In that moment, bearing our sin, the <coughs> sin of the world. <clears throat> we do know that crucifixion was kept carefully developed to be the most agonising, brutal <coughs> way to die. It was slow, public, desperate, and bloody. <coughs> it involved nails being driven through the wrists and the ankles 
joints, so that the victim was suspended by metal on bone and nerves. And this resulted in a slow death of dehydration and suffocation, all in front of a baying, angry crowd held back by Roman soldiers who would do all they could to add to the mockery and misery of the victims. It was for its time the most modern method of torture and execution and death, devised by the so-called most advanced nation at the time on earth. By it the Romans spread fear and dread among their empire and their enemies. As we've noted before, it is truly extraordinary that many centuries before these events recorded in the Gospels, even before the Roman Empire was known about, the suffering and death of Jesus is described in Psalm 22. Let me remind you uh, again of some of those verses. He actually used the prayer that he cried from the cross are the exact words from Psalm 22. It begins, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far away from my groan for help? Every day I call to you, my God, but you do not answer. Every night you hear my voice, but I find no relief. Then he goes on, uh, but I am a worm, not a man. I am scorned and despised by all. Everyone who sees me mocks me. They sneer and shake their heads, saying, Is this the one who relies on the Lord? Then let the Lord save him. The Lord loves him so much. Let the Lord rescue him. These are the very words that the Pharisees were using. And it talks about his birth from his mother's womb. Then he says, Do not stay so far from me, for trouble is near. No one else can help me. My enemies surround me like a herd of wolves. Like lions, they open their jaws against me, roaring and tearing into, into their prey. My life is poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, melting within me. My strength has dried up like some baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You have laid me in the dust and left me for dead. My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. An evil gang closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. My enemies stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among themselves and throw dice for my clothing. Doesn't that, isn't that so, such an accurate description of what happened many hundred years later? So God knew, and Jesus knew this, and he still faced this death. Now, have, you, have you heard of the, um, the Anglican priest and writer, Reverend John Stott, mm -hmm. who to be with the Lord? He was the rector of All Souls Langham Place. That's the church next to the BBC. You see? Yeah. He, he wrote this. Here is why it matters. I could never myself believe in God if it were not for the cross. In the real world of pain, how could one worship a God who was immune or distant to it? When we most need courage in our life, Jesus is always there to help us. When we face pain and loss and persecution, misunderstanding, mockery, betrayal, desertion, criticism, rejection, he knows exactly about these things. And he knows what true terror tastes like. Jesus 
empathizes with us. He prays for us. He stays with us to help us and will never let us down. Luke 24, 46 from our passage said, Yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. And then later, um, he tells them, And now I will send the Holy Spirit, just as my Father promised. So we can say, God is with us in that world. God is for us. God loves us. God knows and understands our human frailty and weakness. Jesus died for us, bearing our sins, gifting us forgiveness, freedom and new life for all who repent of their sins and believe on Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. And he sends his Holy Spirit that we might be born again, become the children of God, born again of the Holy Spirit, new birth. And he remains with us to be our helper. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's alongside one, paraclete, the Greek. Friend, advocate, counsellor. He's here to empower us. We can't live the Christian life in our own strength. The Holy Spirit is there to help us, to guide us, to teach us as we read scripture. He gives us understanding to equip us for the life of following Jesus. We have so much to be thankful for. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. So remember, the Lord is with us. Amen. Mm -hmm. Let's share the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the grace of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. 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 Godspeed. Safe journey. Blessings. Bye bye.